This week on The Communicators, our guest is the head of the National Cable and Telecommunications Association, Kyle McSlaro. This week's show looks at the upcoming FCC plan concerning national broadband, as well as Google's recent plan to provide high-speed Internet access. Well, Kyle McSlaro is about to begin his sixth year as president and CEO of the National Cable and Telecommunications Association. Mr. McSlaro, you've had five years now to work with different FCC members. Just wanted to start off this, Communicators, by getting your view or your feel for the new FCC. You know, um, it's interesting. I think the jury's still out uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, even though we've had a new administration for over a year, the new team largely was not in place until last July or, or August. They've had a full plate, um, and I'll say just from my own personal perspective, uh, I think it's a pretty impressive run here over the last you know six months. They've had some huge tasks put before them, and they've tackled them, and they've hired very good people. Um, so I think you know all, all of the omens are very good for a successful run, but I think uh, you know the. The new chairman, Chairman Jen Janikowski, would uh, be the first to say that they're at the beginning of the process, not, not the end. Um, well, one of the proposals that uh, the FCC may or may not be working on, it was reported by Bloomberg just recently, is that uh, the large telcos might have to open up their lines for lease to smaller companies, their broadband lines. Do you see a danger that this could also carry over into cable companies having to open up their broadband lines? Well, I think, I'm not sure if there is a danger. Uh, I think that's a unique situation predicated on a unique statute. I just think as a policy matter, uh, I think it's a bad idea. Um, and I think uh, the idea of line sharing in the abstract sounds, you know, okay, but when you actually play through uh, the investment decisions that have to be made, and these are very expensive networks, particularly fiber loops, which are what's at issue in this case, um, I think, I would just caution uh, any regulator from presuming that, that the kinds of fiber loops or the high capacity lines that we want to deploy across America are going to get done if somebody has to take all their ri at risk capital, put it into the ground, build a network, and then share a line with a bunch of competitors. It may well be that the marketplace produces that kind of result, in which case I have no problem with that. There, there may be an emerging model for that kind of line sharing. But to do it by government fiat, I think, it is uh, something we should be cautious about. We are also joined by Kim Hart, who is the technology reporter for the Hill newspaper. She writes a blog called Hillicon Valley. Yes, hi. Hi, Kyle. Hi. Uh, speaking of the FCC, one of the, the biggest things, the biggest projects that they're working on is the National Broadband Plan. I guess originally that was supposed to be due tomorrow to Congress, right. but it was extended by a month. So we'll have a few more weeks to, to see what they propose. I know that MCTA has been very involved in that process. What are some of the things that you're hoping to see come out of that plan when it does come through? Well, I think um, one of the things we've really been focused on is, is uh, adoption. Uh, as you know, broadband is actually available to 90 plus percent of American households. Um, but there are a number of households uh, that either don't have a computer or don't think broadband is relevant to their lives uh, or because of affordability issues who aren't actually taking broadband that's available at their doorstep. So we've been trying to work with the FCC as they develop their plan to come up with public-private partnerships. Uh, that tackle that problem. So, I, and I th and I think they will. I mean, I don't want to presume what the broadband plan is going to say, but I think the chairman has been very clear that this is a huge priority uh, for him and the FCC in the plan. The other thing I think is uh, interesting, uh, and I'm not exactly sure how they will come at it, but they have talked about it in some of their briefings. Is is understanding the emerging marketplace and the integration of television mm -hmm. and the internet, uh, which is something that we are very supportive of. Now that can go off in you know uh, unhappy ways, but I think uh, actually based on the conversations we've had, I think they're open to a process for for thinking anew about the home environment and how you can make the experience to consumers a lot more seamless. And I think that will be part of it. And of course, it, for those wondering what what does that have to do with broadband, I think it's uh, their theory uh, that. Uh, that the more you can make broadband relevant to the complete experience in the home, the more likely you are, to, again, to help drive broadband adoption. 
And then I think there are some, there are other sort of cats and dogs, very important to our industry or others that they will get into. But I think in general, the more they can lay out a template for action that will help uh, drive investment and provide more opportunities for, for innovation in the entire internet ecosystem, whether it's uh, an internet applications company uh, or broadband providers and uh, everybody in between, I think the more likely they are to, to achieve the twin goals of ubiquitous broadband deployment and universal broadband adoption. And on that same theme of um, integrating TV and broadband, one of the things clearly that the FCC alluded to it a little bit is that they have been really talking a lot about the idea of making a set-top box kind of a gateway to the internet. Um, what does that, what kind of challenges does that pose to the cable industry and even the consumer electronics industry as a whole that creates these set-top boxes? Well, it's interesting because it's, it's not clear to me what the solution is or if there is a solution. Um, I think our approach is, I mean, we, I mean today you, you can, for example, you can buy a, a TV today with an Ethernet port and get internet right on the on the television. You can do the same thing, and the technology is actually right in front of us in terms of the set-top boxes. I think what we're interested in is moving to an environment where people can go into a retail store, buy a device, whether it's a TV or a set-top or a DVR, and have it uh, be able to access uh, video or other applications on the internet. And I think I would argue, and I have argued. Uh, to the FCC that there are current rules in place that I think that impede that and that if they are willing to examine that and sort of move those rules which were probably appropriate you know in 1992 which is really when they started or even the late 90s but are anachronistic uh, in uh, in the 21st century um, I think there's a lot of innovation that's just that's, that's bubbling around and that's that's already ready to, to burst forth so I think the more we can integrate that experience from our, you know, just from our parochial perspective, I think it's a great thing to be able to tell our subscribers, our customers, look, you can get the complete package uh, by subscribing to us. You get phone and high-speed internet uh, and, and obviously the video services, and we can integrate these offerings and help you network them around the house. That's a great place to be. Mr. McSlair, I want to follow up on a previous answer you gave when you talked about the National Broadband Plan and you said that it could go in unhappy ways. In your view, what would be some of those unhappy ways? I think uh, one of the things that, that we have been concerned about is, is uh, and Kim alluded to this, is there have been proposals in terms of, of the integration of TV and the Internet um, that basically say, here's the solution. My caution to the FCC is I don't think anybody knows right now what the solution is, or as I said, if there's a solution, maybe many solutions. Uh, we want to be a constructive part because I think there's no industry that wants more to move in this direction. But I don't think anybody knows right now, today, uh, what the technology platform of the solution is. So what I would caution against is having them propose, here's the solution, you know, in March of 2010. I think what's got to happen is has to be a pretty robust process with a lot of stakeholders because remember you've got cable you've got the satellite providers you have the telephone providers you've got all the content companies who have a huge say in how content is moved around the home uh, and how it's going to be applied on the internet you've got the consumer electronics manufacturers you've got the studios I mean there are a lot of players here this is pretty complicated uh, and I think uh, the more the FCC can facilitate all of us working together cooperatively the more likely we are to reach a result that will be good for consumers. Is there a chance that uh, net neutrality provisions could be included in the National Broadband Plan? I think they've pretty clearly indicated that that will be in a different proceeding. It wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if they alluded to the vision of net neutrality that's in the other the, the notice of proposed rulemaking, but I don't think they're going to go down the path in the broadband plan. I think they see them as complementary but distinct enterprises. And speaking of net neutrality, uh, the Comcast decision is expected sometime this spring. What do you expect to come out of that? <laughs> I know we're all predicting, but... <laughs> yeah, I've been around long enough to know, um, of course, what you're alluding to is the fact that there was an oral argument recently, and of course, everybody's reading the tea leaves of right. what, how the judges uh, ask their questions and what they seem to indicate. Um, and I've been around long enough. Uh, and once was a lawyer, although I don't want to be thought of as a lawyer now, um, to understand that you can completely get head faked on this. So 
I don't truly know what to expect. I think the arguments that Comcast had were very strong. I think that was reflected in the oral argument. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, everybody understands uh, that the court decision could come out in a way that either questions the jurisdiction or at least questions what was done in that case. Um, but it's anybody's guess. Um, and going back to a point that you alluded to a minute ago about the public-private partnerships for increasing broadband adoption, particularly in schools, that's something that uh, the cable industry and NCTA had put, to get, put forward a proposal back in December, was it? Uh, something like that, To, yeah. to yeah. provide discounted cable service or broadband service to schools, to students who were part of the free or reduced lunch program right. through there. And uh, Congressman Ed Markey also proposed a similar program, uh, E-rate program, last week in a bill. Right. What are some of the similarities between those two programs, or how do you see this going forward? Well, I think what they have in common, um, what we tried to do, just to, to back up, uh, our program is called Adoption Plus, or A Plus, and as you said, it's targeted to, to children who receive a reduced or free school lunch programs. So we're trying to get to lower income households that don't have broadband. So we basically came up with a proposal where our industry would participate um, by providing a 50% discount for two years um, on, on, the, on the broadband service itself. And the idea is to get consumer electronics companies to discount to computers or, or laptops um, and to, we, we urge the federal government to help fund digital literacy programs because we can't educate kids about uh, what it means to be online and issues like online safety then they're not actually going to you know, maximize the value of the broadband service. Uh, what I think Congressman Markey and others are proposing is essentially uh, the same kind of thing. The common element is to go toward schools, toward low-income households, um, but there's a lot more federal funding at issue. And we, you know, either, either way, I think we're, we're happy with it. I mean, we, the, the idea is how do you get to households that have so far been resistant to adopting broadband so that we can get those kids, and, and we identified middle school as the right sort of balance of maturity in order, in order to take advantage of broadband, but young enough that it actually could materially affect their lives and provide them greater opportunity. And whether it's a government program and we sort of work through that, or it's a public-private partnership like we've proposed, and you know, Chairman, uh, Chairman Janikowski was very, very complimentary of the A-plus uh, proposal, uh, I think they will have their own proposals that more or less, you know, target the same kind of uh, segment of the population. I, I don't think it really much matters, but I think the goal is let's move the needle. What are the downsides to your member companies uh, to a public-private partnership and, and taking federal monies? Well, it's... Uh, in our case, our, we actually designed our proposal so that we wouldn't ask for any federal money. Now, we think there should be some federal money in the program, but our proposal had the federal money going directly to school districts so they could fund, fund uh, digital literacy programs. We actually went through, it was, it was sort of a long process that I worked through with my companies, uh, and our goal was, you know what, we wanted to raise our hands and say, we want to be part of the solution. We're not going to ask for a dime of federal money. Um, and to make it easier, in, in essence, for other people to sign on and to gravitate toward that kind of partnership. Um, there may be, as we were talking about before, legislation that actually uses E-rate funds, and that may be something uh, that goes to providers. But actually, I would argue that the best outcome is, and I think they've got some pilots embedded in this legislation that do this, I think the best outcome is to figure out if you're going to use federal monies for low-income households, how to put it in the hands of the consumer and let them make their choices in terms of laptops or which broadband provider they want to use rather than funding the broadband providers. This is C-SPAN's Communicators Program. Our guest is Kyle McSlero, who is President and CEO of the National Cable and Telecommunications Association. Just a little bit about our guest. He has served as Deputy Secretary of the Department of Energy. He spent several years as a top aide to Senator Dole and to Senator McConnell when they were the majority leaders. Senator Lott, actually. And Senator yeah, Lott. Yeah. Sorry about that. And uh, um, we are also joined by Kim Hart, who writes the Hillicon Valley column for the Hill newspaper. Next question. I wanted to go back to the TV and Internet question because it's getting so much attention these days uh, and specifically talk about the TV Everywhere proposal or initiative that the cable industry has helped to spearhead here. Um, it's 
Comcast is branded Xfinity, is that right? right? Uh, so basically that means that Comcast subscribers would be able to go online and have access to a very wide array of content online as well as through their TV. Some consumer advocates and public interest groups have said that that's anti-competitive in that it could snuff out some of the smaller online video startups and competitors out there. What, how do you respond to that? Well, um, my friends in the public, and they are my friends, even though we squabble all the time, uh, they can't take yes for an answer sometimes. Uh, for years, the big complaint was, we can't get cable programming online. You could get some of the broadcast programming through Hulu and otherwise, but we can't get the cable program, the cable networks, you know, the ESPNs, the, you know, the USA, that kind of content. Um, and, and, and you couldn't. Uh, for a very good reason, that the, the cable programming ecosystem is really funded on a dual st stream. Uh, what pays for the investment in that content is both the subscription fee and advertising revenues. And people haven't quite figured out how to replicate that online. So the right way to think about this is that it's really, it's not so much the cable provider, it's the cable networks, the content creators, who've been looking online saying, how do we get our content out there and do it in a way um, that preserves the ecosystem and extends from, from traditional video in the home to online so you can access it on your PC. So it's an experiment, and I should say there's no one model. There is a TV everywhere experiment, but there are actually lots of discussions taking place between uh, content producers and, and cable, satellite, and telephone um, providers. Um, but the idea is to take content that's not currently available online and get it to consumers um, and, and at the moment, the model that people are largely looking at is one where if you're already an existing subscriber, you can access it online, which seems to me a perfectly sensible <laughs> result. But uh, as you point out, others, others disagree. So I truly just don't get it. And that was one of the concerns raised by legislators recently uh, discussing the NBC Comcast right. joint venture or merger, however we're referring to it, um, was that there could be a restriction of content. How do you address that? Well, all I can say is, and, and I shouldn't talk about the merger per se, but um, directionally, if you just step back and you look at all the trends, you're getting more content on more devices, on more platforms every day. It's not going the other direction. So while I understand that people may have those concerns, the evidence in the real world over the last 10 years is exactly the opposite direction. And there's, I can't even think of an example that goes the opposite direction. So. I think our companies, whether it's you know, providers of video or those who actually invest to create the content, um, are working overtime to figure out how to get consumers all of the content they want on every platform or device that they may own as quickly as possible. To me, that's just a, that's a, the obvious right and great outcome for consumers. And uh, to go to some news that Google made last week and made quite a splash um, in the media is their announcement that they were going to build out a few test markets, uh, mm -hmm. a pretty super fast broadband network of one gigabit per second. Um, what does that, how do you view that? How does the cable industry see this as a, a new competitor, a new entrant? No, I don't think it's, I mean, I, I think it's unrealistic and I think they said they're not planning on rolling out uh, they're, they're, they're not planning on turning themselves into a network provider, so mm -hmm. I, I think competition isn't even the issue. I think the way, at least I think about it, is it's an experiment, which I think is great. Um, you know, it's interesting, I mean, it has to be an experiment, beca uh, because as you said, it's, uh, you know, one gigabit per second right. service. Well, by and large, there are very few PCs or laptops in America, in, a, in, a, in your house, that can even handle that, right? Your Ethernet port, your hard drive capacity and throughput capacity can't handle a gigabit. So, but that'll change, you know, mm -hmm. over time. So you can't even use it today, even if it, even if we're offered, if you have that kind of device in the home. The way I look at it, um, in terms of the competition point, is we we make available today. Every cable customer has much more than a gigabit of capacity of data available to them. Now we're using it for high-speed internet, a lot of video, phone other interactive services, but over time, I would expect that, that and, and it's a fairly low cost solution for us, we have such a robust capacity and plant in front of, of consumers' homes, we can, as demand uh, uh, calls for it, we can start switching more and more capacity into the internet side. We're already rolling out uh, the fastest national broadband plant in America. That's not an announcement, that's real world 
today. So, you know, from my perspective, if this experiment uh, allows us to, to discover new applications uh, at, at, you know, super fast capacity, uh, that's actually great news for my industry because we're the only ones who have a national broadband plant capable of migrating to provide that kind of capacity. And part of that experiment is also to apply net neutrality rules on that network. Uh, do you have it? What do you think will happen just to, it's, it's, as you said, an experiment to kind right. of prove a point? What will the outcome be? I don't know. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Google, in the last couple of episodes where they've either made an announcement or said they were going to do something when it comes to networks, either failed to do it uh, in the case of San Francisco and, and the Earthlink uh, uh, experiment, or they backed away in the case of the 700 megahertz auction where they said they were going to bid, they asked for all of those regulatory mandates and then they decided not to play. Right. So I have no idea if they're going to do the same thing today, which is why I keep saying it's an announcement. <laughs> you know, we'll wait and see. Um, but you know, if there is, I mean, my view is if there is a world where um, different economic models along the lines that they've suggested turn out to be uh, economically viable, that's great. I'm just leery of asking the federal government to impose all of those rules um, at the outset when we already have a world that we know works pretty well, which is largely uh, a lightly regulated world, which has allowed us to deploy all this broadband. It's allowed companies like Google to flourish uh, and, and the other great um, applications companies on the internet. Uh, is a Google a, a company getting that big, is it becoming a force, a legislative force here in Washington, and does that affect how you do your work? Yeah, I, I, I mean, for one, they have very good people in town, uh, people I respect. Um, but look, they've got $21 billion of cash lying around, right, which is why they can throw a half a billion dollars or whatever it is at this experiment. Actually, I would, I would urge them to throw half a billion dollars at low-income households and help with broadband adoption and actually materially move the needle there. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, I mean, they're a very sophisticated company, and, and uh, uh, you know, like a, a lot of companies that have sort of come out of nowhere, you know, over the last decade, uh, it didn't take them very long uh, to recognize that, that policy made in Washington is going to have an enormous impact on their business. Now, my, my, my one disappointment is that they don't perceive, uh, to the extent that I wish they did, that when they try to regulate everybody else, they, they just haven't learned the lesson that eventually they come for them too. But unfortunately, that'll happen. Uh, and, uh, Mr. McSlero, uh, uh, we've got a Hill reporter here, and we've had a lot of retirements up on the Hill. We've got a new FCC, which has a full plate of issues. Uh, is there an appetite for telecom reform or refinement on Capitol Hill? You're a former Hill staffer. Right. Uh, are you seeing an appetite for reform on Capitol Hill of any type? And is it shifting, is the power structure shifting over to the FCC because of a lack of attention by Capitol Hill? Well, I think uh, I would answer this in two ways. First, I think realistically, it's, you know, February of 2010. It's going to be very hard to move any major piece of legislation through this year. We've already seen that. Uh, and I think everybody is very, has a very practical uh, view about that. On the other hand, uh, those leaders in Congress um, who have telecommunications in their portfolio are still really interested in it. We've had a lot of hearings on it, um, and, and you know, for example, somebody like Chairman Boucher, Rick Boucher from Virginia, has made very clear he's got a couple of priorities. We've actually been working uh, for the last several months with him on the Universal Service Fund reform. Now, I don't know, and I shouldn't prognosticate about whether or not that can actually pass this year, but I think. You know, we tend to think of legislative cycles in years, not, not months. I think a lot of legwork is being done. I think there is a lot of interest in telecommunications. I mean, if people look at this world, they see it's an exciting, dynamic world. And so there's a lot of member interest. But I think you're also right that because Congress has given the task to the FCC to produce a national broadband plan, you've got a new uh, fully constituted FCC with a lot of great commissioners, even though they're different parties and they work well together. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of activity at the FCC, and I think there's a, a natural sort of, you know, tug and pull um, between the FCC and, and those relevant committees in Congress. Um, but there's also a lot of communication that's taking place, you know, between and, and among them. So. In my world, in terms of when I get up, I think about both. I mean, I'm never going to get up and say, I don't have to worry about this, you know, pond. I'll just focus over here because 
either place is, is going to be doing something important. Um, and you talked a little bit about what the Commerce Committee is looking at doing with USF reform. Uh, something that d it's been swirled around in some of the judiciary uh, committees is, is uh, the idea of three strikes and holding internet service providers responsible for keeping their users and their customers, uh, preventing them from piracy right. and uh, counterfeit and, and other uh, illegal downloads. How do you, do you think that a, streak, a three strike proposal which would give a certain number of chances to an uh, internet user before their account is suspended, do you think that's a good idea? Honestly, I'm not sure. Um, and I actually see this from two vantage points, right? I represent both the providers, the ISPs, and those who create content. Awesome. The one thing they have in common is a shared view that we need to combat piracy. Piracy is really um, uh, something that's just devastating. People don't realize how much destruction takes place in terms of, of the return on investment. Um, the, the kind of high quality video that we're talking about is enormously expensive. We all love it and we just assume it grows on trees, but it doesn't. Um, so we all have a joint interest in fighting it. We also have an interest in serving our consumers. Um, in striking the balance, I mean, accord, according to the law, already there's an obligation in, in terms of, that ISPs have to meet to notify consumers when they're notified of an infringement, um, and it leading all the way up in some cases to termination by, by law. Um, but striking the balance, I, I think, I guess where I would come out is I would encourage all of the industries to be working together to, to figure out either company by company or industry by industry solutions that allow us to balance those interests, right? You don't want to end up uh, uh, unwittingly uh, terminating a subscriber who actually didn't do anything wrong mm -hmm. on the one hand. On the other hand, it's vital that we really s send a message that piracy is a crime. I mean, there's no other way to say it. And, and I know a lot of times, and you know, I've got young kids, and you know, a lot of times people sort of laugh about it and think it's funny. It's really not. Um, and I think, so on the one hand, we need to raise the importance of it, but at the other uh, end of the spectrum, I think we need to provide some sense of balance. I'm not sure a one-size-fits-all solution is the best, but I've got an open mind about it. And finally, Kyle McSlero, we've talked throughout this half hour about a lot of new technology and, and potential legislation, potential FCC action. It, do you think that the 1990s Telecommunication Act should be updated. Is it time to to change policy given all the new technology? I think we ought to take a look. And of course, Congress uh, started down that road in 2005, 2006, didn't quite cross the finish line. And my guess is, uh, even though that was meant to be an update, you know, 10 years later, that already our thinking would change again. So there's always a little bit of a caution and a worry uh, that you don't want to, even though we do need to update it in a sense, um, you, you worry that you're just going to freeze a snapshot in time based on what we see in the world now, even though underneath there are actually currents going, you know, interesting directions that we're not going to capture. But I think it's time to step back and re-examine the entire framework. And by, by saying it's time, I don't mean this year. I mean, I'm, I'm a realist about it. But I think over the next couple of years, and I think Congress has begun to do this. I think the FCC is going to do a lot of these, these types of examinations. Um, because we've got a very siloed approach uh, and a regulatory approach uh, that sort of categorizes, you know, this person as a telecommunications provider, this person as an information services, and the categories are starting to break down because all of us are starting to look like each other. We're, we all have software and hardware and networks and produce content. Um, and we all kind of know in layman's terms, well, well, we can distinguish them, but for regulatory purposes, I'm not sure it completely works or works as well as it could. This is C-SPAN's Communicators program. Kim Hart writes the Hillicon Valley column for the Hill newspaper. Kyle McSlero is president and CEO of the National Cable and Telecommunications Association.